Good morning. Thanks for joining us today. You know, a lot of us are grieving. So I, I want to ask you, how are you doing today? These are unprecedented times and we're forced to be isolated with very questionable haircuts, right? And we can't do many of the things that we love to do. And you probably know someone who's lost their job, someone maybe who's lost much of their savings. These are tough times. And I want you to know that we care, we're here for you, and you don't have to be alone. You can email us or call us and let us know how we can be of help. Um, you don't have to be isolated from a loving community, and we will be available to support you as part of our family. When we talk about abiding in Christ today, we want you to know that this is an important thing because we were born to do this. God made you to be close with Him. God made you to be in a relationship with Him. He never wanted you to go through life alone. So whatever circumstances you're in right now, God is looking at you and He cares. He has His eyes on the lonely, His eyes on the hurting, the doubting, the struggling, the grieving. He has His eyes on you and on me. You can rest in His arms today. And even though it feels like the world is falling apart around you, you are not alone. The truth is that God cares. He's not forgotten you. So I want to invite you to join me in a prayer. Let's pray. Father, help us to see you present with us. Help us to see that you have not abandoned us, but you are with us in the midst of circumstances that are hard to fully take in. Lord, we do want to see hope, but many of us are grieving. And so we pray we would know and see and even experience your presence comforting us in the midst of very difficult times. Would you open up our hearts, our eyes, our ears to your word this morning? We want to hear from you. We want to experience your love. We want to experience your hope because of Jesus who's present with us right now. And in his name we pray. Amen. We're going to be in John chapter 15 this morning. If you want to join us, I'll be reading verses 1 through 7. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. I want to give you a little cultural background to that text we just read. Jesus has been using powerful images and symbols from Israel's history and scriptures. Things like shepherd, bread, water, and light. Many of Jesus' I am statements have used these images. And now Jesus uses one more powerful image in Jewish culture to talk about himself. In John 15 verse 1, Jesus says, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. You see, the vineyard was one of Israel's most prized historic symbols of its nationhood and inheritance. Just as we might say apple pie and baseball is American, right? Now, Jesus' disciples probably expected Jesus to start talking about Israel. But Jesus instead likens the vine to himself. So essentially what he's saying is, I am the true Israel of God now. Now, for the first century Jew, when Jesus spoke of the vineyard, they knew exactly what he was talking about. They were an agrarian people, and the grapes were one of the most prized crops of the nation. Now, if Jesus were in San Francisco, for example, he might be talking about real estate, or he might be talking about the tech industry. But in Israel, he talks about vineyards. Now, in this chapter, there's this incredible tension, actually, because Jesus is making it clear that his mission is actually coming to an end on planet Earth and that he will be leaving them physically soon. 
So as they leave the upper room in John 14 and head toward the Garden of Gethsemane in John 15, Jesus gives his last instructions to his disciples so that they may be able to carry out his mission while Jesus is physically absent. And in the midst of that, he says, while they're walking to the garden, I am the vine. Now in the temple, you can picture a huge, gigantic grapevine of pure gold that represented Israel. Now, wealthy citizens actually could contribute their own gold to this structure. The vine and the vineyard, remember, were ancient and revered images in Judaism, meaning many things, and particularly that the Israelites themselves were whom Yahweh called to produce fruit. They were the vineyard, and he was the vine dresser. Yahweh planted the vine and, and he tended it so that it would produce fruit. And it would bless all the nations by its fruitfulness. See, but usually scriptures would describe Israel as the vine that failed to live up to its calling. For example, in Psalm 80, it talks there about the Hebrews being the vine brought out of Egypt, while Isaiah 5 has Yahweh pronouncing judgment on this very vine Israel that he planted. And so with this background, Jesus says on that night, I am the vine. So Jesus speaks of himself as the true vine. But what he is implying as well from all his other I am statements is that he is the true temple, the true Israel, the true Torah. In contrast to the false vine of dead religion, Jesus says, I am the only one worth following. Jesus says he's the true vine and that they must choose whom to abide in and with. So therefore, people are the branches that must be connected to Jesus to truly be God's people. They must abide in him. Jesus is saying they can't just play church anymore, but that in their hearts they need to change and align themselves with him. Now I know our lives have been turned upside down in a matter of weeks. And because of the coronavirus, we are spinning, trying to find our sense of bearings. But if we will abide in Jesus, he will use this to prune us, to shape us, to grow us in new ways. Because God is the gardener and Jesus is the vine. And the branches do not have purpose within themselves, but are intended to produce fruit for the gardener. So the fact is that you belong to God. In John 15, verse 1, again, Jesus reminds us where he says that my father is the vine dresser. Arthur Margaret Feinberg visited Christoph Anderson, a, a master vintner in Napa Valley, who is responsible for some of the best wines from the region. When asked about what makes a great wine, he said, you know, it's a long-term investment. Between the first planting and the first bottle is about eight years. You're probably not making a profit until year 15 or year 20. And so Margaret Feinberg sees this as an investment of God where his time and energy and care and there's expectation and promise of a fruitful and abundant harvest. Just like in Isaiah 5 where God, the vine dresser, expects his vineyard Israel to produce fruit. And so in John 15, 5, when Jesus says, I'm the vine and you are the branches, and then he says, whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And then Feinberg observes again that the vine is the source of everything for the branch. Every nutrient, every life-giving drop of water, every hint of growth. In that place where I am abiding in Christ, under the watchful eye of the Father, I can trust the Father. That he will be pruning those areas and desires in my life that don't line up with where he wants me to go. Reminds him of, of a quote from A.W. Tozer who said, While it looks like things are out of control, behind the scenes there is a God who hasn't surrendered his authority. So next time you get anxious, I want you to remind yourself of this saying that I am not in control, but I am deeply loved by the one who is. 
An expert winemaker from Italy told a friend of mine that the quality of the wine is based on the suffering of the vine. Isn't that very interesting? We think about it, you see, Jesus took the cross and he suffered so that your life could be sweeter. Jesus says you are a branch and you must stay connected to him, the vine. And that the father, the vine dresser, he'll be pruning you, but it will be for your best. See, our suffering will not be wasted. God will use it to help you grow, to make your life sweeter and to be a blessing to a thirsty world. You see, God is all about growth as we stay connected to the vine. I like the message translation of John 15, 4. It says, live in me, make your home in me, just as I do in you. See, Jesus uses an image that speaks about growth. This is not a static relationship, but it, an organic and symbiotic connection that pulses with life in God's own spirit. And so we know deep inside that God made us for growth. Jesus is committed to our fruitfulness and wants us to experience life to the full. Zoe life, as we've been talking about the last few weeks. Exhilarating life. Joyful life. See, this is not just external compliance, but true internal transformation. I don't know if you know this funny saying is that marriage is when a woman exchanges the attention of many men for the inattention of one. In actuality, it could be either the wife or the husband who might come to a pastor for counseling and says that their spouse, their partner, isn't keeping up their end of the bargain. One spouse might be there only because their partner has threatened to leave, in fact. And so perhaps the offending spouse might say in defense, well, uh, I knew these things bothered you, but I didn't know it made you feel this bad. I will change. I will change. And so the couple leaves the counseling session, and initially things get better for the couple. And there are external forces like fear, uh, fear of, oh, well, I can't live without them. I'm afraid of losing them. Or the external force of pride, uh, the pride that says, well, I can do better than these other partners. I'll, I'll improve myself. And those things do help initially. External forces help us make changes. But instead of bringing lasting change, what happens is that fear and pride actually bring a new problem. It brings anger and disappointment. You see, you're only changing so you won't lose something. That's never a good motivation. You're only changing externally, but God wants an internal change. See, Jesus is after organic inner transformation that leads to a fruitful life of loving others. A vital connection that transforms you from the inside out, drawing on the life of Christ. You see, most Christians enter into kind of mechanical uh, 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 compliance in order to fix things, these external things that others might discover. And so you get busy at church to prove that you're a good person, or you, you go to meetings at church to show you're a good Christian. You get rid of kind of the big obvious sins. That's the external mechanical compliance. But this is just inferring God's love instead of experiencing God's love. You're not really abiding. See, without experiencing God's love by abiding in Christ, then you'll notice that even after years of church attendance, years of trying to be a good person, that you really aren't changing much. You're still, you're still fearful. You're still, you can't stand criticism. You want and demand respect and control. You are no more loving than you were five years ago because all you were doing was changing external things. Jesus didn't come to earth and die on a cross to just change you externally, to make you look more religious, to make you a good person, as they say. He came to impact every decision you will make about the things you worry about and the things you dream about. So let me ask you, what do you worry about right now? Jesus says, I care about those worries. What do you dream about right now? Jesus says, I care about those dreams. He wants to be part of all of you. He wants you to be connected to him, the vine, himself. 
so that your dreams can have direction, your tragedies can become triumphs, your pain can have purpose when you stay connected and abiding in Jesus. See, the only way to become a Christian is to get grafted into him. It's not enough to admire Jesus. He wants you to worship him. You see, being religious or being philanthropic doesn't make you close to God and neither does being a good person. You must abide. You must be grafted in. You see, now most Americans believe in some kind of God and some kind of blissful afterlife. And most are certain and sure that they're going to this afterlife if it exists. Most believe that being a good person is what enables them to go to heaven. Now imagine Jesus saying to us, none of you are going to make it based on your goodness because none of you are really good. See, that's what Jesus is saying when he says he is the true vine. You can't rely on yourself. The scripture says you can do nothing apart from me. And that includes trying to earn your way into God's good graces. See, most Americans say, well, I believe in a higher power. I'm a good person. And that higher power just wants me to be good, right? But Jesus says, no. See, even if you, you're not perfect, at least you're not as bad as others you know. You see, what most people believe is that there is this higher power and that you can prove that you're one of the good people. But really, who's good? Who's really perfect enough to show that they've earned their way back into God's good graces? There's this belief that if there is a hell, it's for people who hurt children or steal money, but not me, not for good people like me. But how good is good enough to impress God? Jesus says you must be grafted in. You must abide in me. God is perfect and knows everything about us. If we can project your, your worst moments, your most hateful thoughts, or your most shameful acts onto this screen right now, what would people think about you? See, God knows our worst, and he still loves you. He wants to be with you. You can try to make up for the bad by doing good, trying to balance the scales, right? But how do you know when you're done? How do you know when you've worked hard enough to balance out the bad in your life? How can you know how much good you need to do to outweigh the bad karma, as some people put it? In John 15, verse 6, Jesus reminds us that if anyone does not abide in me, that he is thrown out. See, Jesus says you can't fake it. It must be simply by abiding in him and trusting in his grace. Lead singer Bono of the band U2 was asked at a uh, time, can you differentiate between Christianity and the other religions of the world? And he replied, well, all the other religions of the world, in one way or another, teach karma. You know karma, the Eastern religions concepts where evil you do, it gets attached to your soul, and as you transmigrate from one experience to another, you carry the weight and agony and the pain of the former sins with you. Karma is taught by all the other religions of the world in that you can never get rid of your sin. You have to work it off somehow. You have to get punished for it in some way. And then Bono then said, all the other religions of the world teach karma. Only Jesus teaches grace. See, Jesus says that the religious system 2,000 years ago and to Americans today that there's nothing you can do to gain entrance into heaven. You can't get in by your birthright, your ethnicity, or your good works. You must be connected to the vine. You can't earn God's love. And that's good news because if you didn't earn it, you can't lose it. God's love is the only unearnable and unlosable love in your life. No one or nothing can compare to that. No one is being saved by being a good person. And Jesus is challenging his own disciples to consider if they are truly connected to him. No one is saved by just going to church. No one is saved by saying a certain prayer. No one is saved by being baptized or confirmed or going on a mission trip as good as those things are. Jesus says you must remain in him. You must abide if you want to be assured you're in God's family. He's not asking you to do anything to earn his love. He's simply asking you to abide in him, to rest in him, to dwell in him, to abide in him, and he will do great things through you. Rest in his arms. 
of grace. My two daughters, Avery and Grayson, have brought so much joy into my life. Even if they think that dad can be kind of boring when they listen to him on Sundays, they're still, they're amazing kids who are, they're talented and they're smart and they're kind. And if I could say so myself, they're very good looking, but I'm a little biased, right? But I don't love them because of what they do or what they look like or how they perform. I love them simply because they are. They're mine. They belong to me. You know, my greatest joy isn't when they do something important, but when they are simply with me. Here's a picture of Grayson at a few months old, sleeping in my arms. And here's Grayson again just last week, again sleeping in my arms. Friends, it never gets old to hold the one you love never does. Nick Vujicic was born with no arms and no legs, and he thought his life was worthless until he decided to abide in Jesus. Here's his story. Take a look. Hi, my name is Nick Vujicic, and when I was born without arms and legs, my parents had no idea that their limbless boy would turn into the hands and feet of the love of Jesus Christ spread all around the world. As a child, I was bullied and I went to Sunday school and learned that Jesus loved me, that he had a hope plan in the future for me as well. Well, I'm like, what kind of plan is this? Can I suggest the plan B? So I prayed for arms and legs and they did not come. And when I didn't hear anything from heaven, I started doubting that he indeed had a plan for me. So I prayed for arms and legs, but what I realized what I needed more was heaven, peace, purpose, and forgiveness of my sin. At age 10, I tried to commit suicide because of the bullying predominantly at school. I didn't feel like I would ever be independent and only a burden to my parents. I'd always be alone and never get married and never have a family and never find a purpose worth living for, hence a value worthy. So I tried to commit suicide at age 10 with six inches of bath water. I was stopped by one thought. And the thought was seeing my mum and my dad crying at my grave, wishing they could have done something more. At age 15, I gave my life to the Lord Jesus Christ because I realized more than arms and legs, I wanted purpose and salvation and healing, forgiveness of my sins. I wanted Jesus. But I still didn't know why I was born this way. Well, in John chapter 9, everyone asked Jesus, why was that blind man born that way? Jesus said it was done so that the works of God would be revealed through him. What I realized, I was actually as blind as the blind man. We had no idea what God had in store. And just because you don't see what God has in store doesn't mean his store is empty. Kids come up and say, what happened? And I say, cigarettes. <laughs> Definitely as a child and a teenager, I'd never thought I'd be a speaker that would travel around the world and meet presidents and speak at congresses and be in stadiums as large as 110,000. I had no idea, and I just give God all the glory and all the praise for the people who pray for us, the people who support us, and made this possible to travel around and preach the gospel to millions of souls. God loves me not because of what I can do or what I will do for the kingdom of God. He just loves me for me. When I put my little foot on my wife's womb as she was pregnant with our first son, uh, I felt him kick and I looked at my wife in her eyes and I said, babe, I love him. I never touched him, saw him, heard him laugh, see him smile. He never earned my love. That love was always there from the beginning, before he was even born. So be challenged today to know that God is not done with you yet. He wants to stretch you a little bit. And I dare you to believe in the greatness of our God because he has no limit. This is what a life looks like when you abide in Jesus. You don't have to be impressive. You don't have to be important. You don't even need arms and legs. You just need to abide and God will use you. See, at Jesus' baptism, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, he heard this voice again, the Father saying to Jesus, this is my beloved Son. And so keep in mind before Jesus did anything important, 
before he did a miracle, before he preached a sermon, before he ever said that he was the way, the truth, and the life, before he ever said, I am the resurrection and the life, I am the vine, what he could say was that I am the beloved. I am loved by the Father. So I want to remind you that before you did anything for God, he was already willing to give up everything so that you could be connected to him. He gave up his beloved son that you might find a home in God. Jesus says in Matthew 26, 29, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. So when Jesus lifted that cup of wine with his followers, knowing that he would be betrayed and abandoned and crucified, he was already looking forward to that day when he would welcome us home, when we would be with him forever. And so friends, keep abiding in him, especially amidst these difficult times. He will carry you through. You don't need to do anything impressive. Just abide in him. Christian writer Laura Kelly Finucci penned this poem about how to survive this pandemic. She says, when this is over, may we never again take for granted a handshake with a stranger, full shelves at the store, conversations with neighbors, a crowded theater, Friday night out, the taste of communion, a routine checkup, the school rush each morning, coffee with a friend, the stadium roaring, each deep breath, a boring Tuesday, life itself. When this ends, may we find that we have become more like the people we wanted to be, we were called to be, we hope to be. And may we stay that way, better for each other because of the worst. You see, you cannot control your circumstances, but you can choose to abide. You can choose to make your home with Christ and stay connected to the vine, the source. Let God the Father prune you in this season. Welcome it, invite it. Let him give you hope because you know he wants only good for you. See, our natural temptations is to make other things our vine. And so some try, people try to be a good person, for example, but you never can know if you're good enough, right? Some people turn to power and possessions as their vine or control, but you'll be striving your whole life to keep all of these things you've acquired to feel good about yourself or or you're going to end up feeling devastated because you never could acquire these things or keep them. So let me ask you again, what are the other vines that you are tempted to stay connected to, that you're driven to depend on, to try to find nourishment in? Because these are false vines. Jesus says, I want to be your vine, your source, your identity. He wants to be your reason for waking up your reason for living each day. He says, if you will remain in him and stay connected to the vine, you will find your deepest satisfaction, even in the midst of the toughest of times. You'll find the love you've always been looking for, a love that you did not earn, a love that you cannot lose. You can rest in the arms of the Father. He will say, he will never let you go. He will never forsake you, never leave you, always be with you in life, in sickness, and in death. And so may we become this unstoppable force for good, not because we worked harder, not because we are more important, not because we are impressive, but because simply we abided in Jesus, the vine. Because we received the pruning of the Father, the loving pruning of a good God. And so with that in mind, would you join me? In prayer. Lord, would you help us to keep following you by abiding in you, by meditating on your scriptures, your word, by letting it seep deep into our hearts and our souls, our spirits, our minds, that we would become shaped like you. We would be more like you, Jesus, as we stay connected to you. 
Father, forgive us for resisting your pruning. Help us to know and believe it's for our own good. And Lord, I pray for those who are really struggling in the season, listening right now, and they're struggling to have faith. They're struggling to see the good that you have for us, Lord. We pray for each of those struggling that you would give them hope. That you would help us to know it's okay to struggle. It's okay to grieve. It's okay to feel sadness. But in the midst of that, may we never believe that we have been abandoned and always know that you're present, that you promise to complete the work that you began in us. You'll be faithful to complete it until that day when Jesus, you will drink that cup anew, that you would receive all of us as part of your vine, Lord, your branches welcomed home into this new kingdom of God, this beautiful vineyard, Lord, that is to come. Thank you, Lord, for that promise that we are safe in you. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen.